A reading from the book of the prophet Amos. Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, Woe to the complacent in Zion, lying upon beds of ivory, stretched comfortably on their couches. They eat lambs taken from the flock and calves from the stall. Improvising to the music of the harp, like David, they devise their own accompaniment. They drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the best oils. Yet they are not made ill by the collapse of Joseph. Therefore, now they shall be the first to go into exile, and their wanton revelry shall be done away with. The word of the Lord. A reading from the first letter of St. Paul to Timothy. But you, man of God, pursue righteousness, devotion, faith, love, patience, and gentleness. Compete well for the faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called when you made the noble confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you before God, who gives life to all things, and before Christ Jesus, who gave testimony under Pontius Pilate for the noble confession, to keep the commandment without stain or reproach, until the appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ, that the blessed and only ruler will make manifest at the proper time, the King of kings and the Lord of lords who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, and whom no human being has seen or can see, to him be honor and eternal power. Amen. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus said to the Pharisees, There was a rich man who dressed in purple garments and fine linen and dined sumptuously each day. And lying at his door was a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who would gladly have eaten his fill of the scraps that fell from the rich man's table. Dogs even used to come and lick his sores. When the poor man died, he was carried away by angels to the bosom of Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. And from the netherworld, where he was in torment, he raised his eyes and saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he cried out, Father Abraham, have pity on me. Send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am suffering torment in these flames. Abraham replied, My child, remember that you received what was good during your lifetime, while Lazarus likewise received what was bad. But now he is comforted here, whereas you are tormented. Moreover, between us and you, a great chasm is established to prevent anyone from crossing who might wish to go from our side to yours or from your side to ours. He said, Then I beg you, Father, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they too come to this place of torment. But Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. He said, Oh no, Father Abraham, but if someone from the dead goes to them, they will repent. Then Abraham said, If they will not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be persuaded if someone should rise from the dead. The Gospel of the Lord. About seven years ago, I gave scandal to a man who was in need through my poor example. It happened while I was still living in Rome with my brothers. It occurred one evening, I was dressed in my clerics. We were going to meet up with Americans who were on pilgrimage. So we were going to meet them. And so we were actually, I vividly remember, passing by St. Peter's Square, but then we started going uh, towards an area which uh, I didn't know, and I wasn't informed where the place would be. And at a certain point, I'm with my brothers, but I fall behind because I think I'm adjusting my shoe, and once I'm ready to go, they're kind of telescoping ahead of me. 
and I'm kind of in panic mode. I don't have a phone. I don't know where I'm going. They're about to turn the corner, and I'm, I start running. That's kind of what I do. I need to catch up to them. Well, at a certain point, as I'm in the process of running, I see a man in need who's looking for handouts, and he's clearly going out of his way to come towards the trajectory of my pathway. And I, at this point, you know, I'm kind of running. A little bit impatient. Perhaps it's because I've been a little bit impatient over all of my years in Rome of the poor not simply asking for things, but aggressively asking for things. When you, even after you admit that I literally don't have any money, I don't have anything to give you, and they'll be aggressive, and it's just rubbed me the wrong way. Perhaps it's that impatience, and perhaps it's. The circumstance of kind of being in a panic mode. I need to catch up with my brothers. I decide I'm going to be an efficient American, and I'm going to inform this gentleman that I just don't have anything for him. I'm going to save him all that effort and uh, his 15 seconds of effort. So as I'm running, I simply say, "I'm sorry, I don't have anything for you. Don't bother." I say it in Italian. And as I'm moving along, again, I'm kind of. I've got blinders on me, and I'm just going. I know where I've got to go. And he says something that just stunned me. And I could hear he says under his breath, "Pharisee." And I remember I was still moving, and I heard that as hypocrites. I was so disoriented. I didn't even know how to. Process that. I was like, I've got to just do the one thing that I know I'm supposed to do, and I'm processing that. But I was kind of processing that all evening, and I didn't. I had to bring that to prayer. In today's gospel, we hear about this parable of a rich man and Lazarus. This rich man who is unnamed. He does not have a name. And in Hebrew culture, if you do not have a name, that's a great disgrace or dignity because a name is eminently important in the Hebrew culture. So it's another way of saying that this rich man is kind of forgotten into oblivion because of his actions, and the poor man Lazarus in need. Now the first reading talks about the dangers of wealth, but we need to understand that this rich man's problem is not his wealth. While wealth can be an obstacle to our love for God, just like anything can be an obstacle to our love for God, clearly we're not going to demonize wealth, because we know a lot of wealthy people, even in the Gospels, even friends of Jesus, Joseph of Arimathea, and many others, who are great friends of God. So we need to just very clearly make that distinction. This man's problem is not his wealth. This man's problem. Is that he is spiritually blind, and that has rendered him insensitive to the human person before him, insensitive to the needs of the person before him. I would say that he's too self-absorbed, and when we're too self-absorbed, that's a hindrance to relationship because we're isolated. We're all wrapped up and enveloped in ourselves. Maybe we could say that this man's sin isn't so much what he did, but what he didn't do—the sin of omission rather than commission. C.S. Lewis, in his work *The Weight of Glory*, remarks of the incredible weight. And how amazing every single person is, and he says, "It's a serious thing to live in a society of possible gods and goddesses. To remember that the dullest and most uninteresting person you can talk to may one day be a creature which, if you saw it now, you would be strongly tempted to worship." It is with awe that we should conduct all our dealings with one another, all our friendships, all loves, all play, all politics, because 
There are no ordinary people. You have never talked to a mere mortal. It is immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Immortal horrors or everlasting splendors. And next to the blessed sacrament itself, your neighbor is the holiest object presented to your senses. I deeply regret my poor example that evening seven years ago. I certainly didn't see that man as the holiest object presented to my senses in that circumstances next to the Blessed Sacrament. If I could done that over, what could I have done? Notwithstanding the fact that I'm in a rush and there's a little bit of anxiety, there are things that I could have done. I did not even acknowledge him as a person. I did not even find out his name. Whatever the situation, I always have 15 seconds. I can take a deep breath and say, Hello, what is your name? My name's Edward. I'm sorry, I really, literally do not have any money or anything that I can give you. But what I do have, I give to you in Christ Jesus. I share that wealth with you. It takes no longer than 10 or 15 seconds, but I could acknowledge the holiness before me of God's presence in this person and not simply writing him off as just this unnamed poor person. You know, poor people don't exist. Robert or James or David exists. But when we start categorizing people, that is so diabolical. I did not even acknowledge him as a person. I did not find out his name. I did not give him the time that he deserves. And in doing so, I did not recognize his dignity. I could have treated him with dignity. And he was so scandalized because I did not treat him with love. I deeply regret and I have prayed with that incident. I have asked God for forgiveness. I have asked God that a holy priest would make reparation for my poor example by treating him with the love and dignity that he deserves, that every one of us deserves. Do I, do we recognize God's presence in one another? We hear of this notion of the church's preferential treatment of the poor, the preferential option, that Jesus has a particular affinity for the poor. Mother Teresa refers to it as God who is present under the distressing disguise of the poor. So that begs the question, who are the poor in my life? Concretely, they have to be persons named, not just an abstract poor. Perhaps the poor are those who risk being neglected by us, who we can possibly be spiritually blind and insensitive to. Who are those particular people? Perhaps it's people who are materially poor. Perhaps familiarity breeds a certain contempt, so maybe it's those we are most familiar with, our family members, our colleagues, our relatives. Perhaps it's those we consider unpleasant. Maybe those are the poor in our lives. Or perhaps it's those we consider kind of boring or long-winded. Perhaps it's those we consider to be emotionally needy. Whoever they are, who are the poor in our lives? Can I recognize God's presence in them? The invitation on this Sunday is to ask Jesus, we are poor. I'm certainly poor. 
I fail over and over again in recognizing God's presence before all the people before me. Perhaps we can ask Jesus for a sacramental vision, a sacramental gaze, a gaze of being able to recognize God's hidden presence in the person who is visible before me. To ask Jesus for a renewed spiritual vision, renew my external senses, renew my internal senses. <coughs> Jesus, grant us your own vision to recognize you in one another.